I'm ready when you guys are. Are we ready? Okay. Yep. All right.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, our Maker and Redeemer, this is your world and we are your people. Come among us and save us. We have willfully misused your gifts of creation. We have seen the ill treatment of others and have not gone to their aid. We have condoned evil and dishonesty and failed to strive for justice. We have heard the good news of Christ, but failed to share it with others. We have not loved you with all our heart, nor our neighbors as ourselves. But God, the source of all mercies, has given us the gift of reconciliation through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, not counting our trespasses against us, but sending the Holy Spirit to shed abroad God's love among us. By the ministry of reconciliation entrusted by Christ to this church, receive his pardon and peace to stand before him in his strength alone, this day and evermore. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in times of trial. Defend them against all enemies of the gospel. And bestow on the church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Okay, the reading is from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, 
the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city, it shall not be moved. God will help when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolation he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among all the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Uh, the gospel is from, uh, from John, eighth chapter, beginning in the 31st verse. This is the holy gospel according to St. John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, we are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Psalm 46, which Jerry just read, uses two different images to envision God's faithfulness. The first image is of an indestructible city. For the Israelites who first sang this psalm, the city of Zion, what we would call Jerusalem, was the seat of the divine presence. And there was no enemy, no disaster, no passage of time that could destroy the dwelling place of God. Though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, the psalmist writes, the city of Zion will stand firm. When Martin Luther wrote that famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress, that image, that psalm, is what he was invoking. 
And you can understand why those early reformers gravitated toward this image. They believed the church was under attack. It was under the threat of what one of Luther's hymns called deceit and sword, which is a coded way of saying the Pope and the Turks. And if you are hiding in a castle because people are trying to kill you, you want high ramparts, thick walls, basically you want a mighty fortress. But in our contemporary American context, that image of God's faithfulness is an immovable, impermeable, indestructible object is probably less useful. What Luther and the reformers saw as strength 500 years ago, we now understand to be a weakness. After all, the mighty fortress that Luther hid in is now kind of a quaint museum. Times change. In a world of religious pluralism, global migration, rapidly evolving cultural norms, the idea of building something that will work in all times and in all places feels more arrogant than it does faithful. Which is why the second image of the psalm might be more helpful for us. The psalmist writes, there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. Faithfulness is not a building that stands for centuries on end, but it's a river. And the power of that image comes from the fact that rivers are dynamic. They're always changing. Unlike a castle that you build and then landmark and then put under glass, rivers are always moving in new directions. The river the psalmist describes doesn't start in Zion, but it ends there. That stream flows out of Eden, forth from a rock in the wilderness, washes Jesus' disciples, animates the early Christian community, and flows all the way into what the author of Revelation calls the city of God. And the current of that river flows in and through each one of us. Now, for the past few years, I've taken Reformation Day to talk a little bit about this book. I have a prop today called From Conflict to Communion, which came out in 2017. And at the end, it offers five ecumenical imperatives. And so we've been doing one each year. And this year, we're up to number three out of five. So I think we actually might finish this thing. Ecumenical imperative number three reads, quote, Catholics and Lutherans should again commit themselves to seek visible unity, to elaborate together what this means in concrete steps, and to strive repeatedly toward this goal. Not just Lutherans and Catholics, of course, but all of us should strive for visible unity. Now that's easier said than done. Sometimes the idea of church unity makes us nervous. Church unity means engaging with other people. And once we start engaging with other people, it becomes harder to see them as stereotypes or caricatures. Sometimes church unity makes us nervous because we think it's going to mean giving up our own identity. It means watering down who we are. You start pursuing church unity, and pretty soon the evangelical Lutheran church in America becomes the generally monotheistic club of the North American free trade zone. Or maybe we avoid seeking church unity because it just doesn't seem like a real priority. It's a fine hobby for some people in Geneva, but not something that actually affects our community. So why don't we spend some time on real stuff? When church unity makes us nervous or seems unnecessary, it's usually because we're thinking of the church as a fortress. And if your goal is to preserve whatever's in the fortress, then church unity doesn't make a lot of sense. It means making the fortress bigger by making the walls thinner or passing meaningless statements about which pile of bricks likes which other pile of bricks. And that's why that river imagery can be so helpful to us. Because unity is an active, dynamic process. It's something that exists in our relationship with one another. Church unity doesn't mean that we become like each other, but it means we recognize the gifts inherent in each of our expressions. It doesn't mean that we all start from the same place, God knows we don't, but that we're all headed in the same direction. There is one river that flows through the city of God, 
but that river has tributaries thrown all across God's creation. And that river is what we're all a part of. That river is wide. It includes Lutherans and Catholics, Reformed and Presbyterians, Pentecostals and non-denoms, members of the AME and Methodists, Orthodox and UCC folks. That river is deep. It includes our synodical and church-wide ministries, Crossroads Camp, Liam, New Jersey, Lutheran World Relief, Lutheran Disaster Response, any number of the organizations whose work we support. And that river is long. It includes all those who have come before us, that first generation of reformers, sure, but everyone who's charted the course of our common life. And it includes everyone who will come after us, everyone who will be enriched and enlivened by our work in witness today. And here's the fun bank shot of that image. The people we pursue church unity with are not just our Catholic and Methodist and Reform contemporaries down the street this morning. We pursue unity with the people who came before us. As the document puts it, we disclose afresh to fellow members the understanding of the gospel and the Christian faith, as well as previous church traditions. We seek to understand the successes, desires, and shortcomings of the people who came before us. When we speak honestly about their shortcomings, in the case of the Lutheran reformers, that means their anti-Semitism, their overly simplistic views of political authority, their ignorance of other faiths, we're not doing it to pat ourselves on the back for being so much more progressive than these people who lived 500 years ago. We're trying to come to terms with the legacy that they've given us that the gift that we've been given through their legacy isn't the only way we have to do things. And it goes the other way too. We seek unity with the people who come after us. We seek unity with the people who live downstream. When we make decisions, we don't just say, what will make this problem go away for me in the next five minutes? We say, what effect will this decision have in the decades to come? We invest time and effort and resources and people who will receive the legacy that we pass on. That unity is a constant presence in our work together. And this unity isn't just a little side project, but it's actually at the heart of our public witness because we know how badly our world needs unity. We need unity with the other people in that river, of course. We can't credibly say that God is reconciling us to one another if our relationships with each other are mocked by animosity and arrogance. We need unity across generations. Too often we ignore our histories and act like the river began with us. We act like we don't live downstream of anyone else and don't live with the consequences of their choices. Or we opt for cheap solutions to fix our problems and don't think about the people who live downstream of us. We take easy solutions and then leave it to them to clean up the mess. Our church, our world, and our community needs unity. We don't need everyone to be the same, but we need a humility about the limits of our own perspective and capabilities and a willingness to trust in the goodness of others. And that's really what lies at the heart of Reformation Sunday. Reformation Sunday, is not a pep rally dedicated to the Lutheran Reformation, a historical event that happened in the past. And to be honest, it's really not even a Sunday just about the church. It's a Sunday about how the Holy Spirit empowers us to seek unity with all God's creation and how God brings us together as a river whose streams lay glad the city of God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
invite you to unmute yourself as we join the church around the world confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles Creed. I believe in God, Father Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord, the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pilate, Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into the dead. He ascended into the dead. He ascended into the dead. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. I believe in the communion of saints. I believe in the communion of saints. I believe in the resurrection of the body. I believe in the last Here. Confidence of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, let us pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Forgiveness of the resurrection of the body. Amen. Renew and inspire the church in the freedom of the gospel. Where the church is an error, reform it. Where the church speaks your truth, strengthen it. Where the church is divided, unify it. Ignite in us the working of your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As the earth changes, as mountains shake and the waters roar, may we care for this planet as a holy habitation for all living things. Sustain all peoples and lands recovering from natural disasters. Lord, in your mercy, guide areas of the world divided or traumatized by conflict, especially in our own land. Free all from slavery and trafficking and protect all in harm's way. We pray especially this week for the people of Canada and the United States of America. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Release those living in bondage to deaths, chronic pain and addiction. Grant healing to those who are ill. 
If you have any petitions, I invite you to offer those at this time. Dan, Neil. God bless people in Colorado. Nita and the Genta family. Deb. His family. Lord, in your mercy. You are our prayer. God of all hope, when money becomes a prison, where wealth turns into addiction, where poverty becomes invisibility, where finance rules every decision, and when consumption replaces compassion, free us to choose life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With thanksgiving, we remember those who have died. Keep us in communion with all the saints until we at last find our rest in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. <clears throat> we offer these prayers in the name of the one who brings us to the river of life, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, Amen.
move on to announcements, joys, and concerns. Um, does anyone have anything they want to share with the congregation? Oh, I just wanted to give an update on my on my foot. It's not a joy, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I did find out I have to basically be in a cast for another two weeks before we can take it off and, and move into a boot. So I was hoping to get the cast off this week was not to be, uh, but uh, two more weeks, hopefully, and then we'll, we'll, we'll see. I'll, I'll go in a boot for about three weeks. They'll see how I'm doing in the boot and kind of make a desert, uh, decision at that time if I'll need any surgery or not. Wow. You're doing a job, man. All right. Thanks for the update, Jason. We'll be hoping for a speedy recovery as possible. I appreciate it. Um, did anyone have anything else they want to share? I didn't see anyone. I have a few things I want to let you know. One is Helga Persky is asking for your thoughts and care. Uh, she has cancer in her sinuses that's returned, and so she's going to be starting treatment for that this week. Um, so if you want to keep her in your thoughts and care, that would be appreciated. Next Sunday is November 1st. I cannot believe it. Um, November 1st is All Saints Sunday this year. And I'm going to throw something in the chat very quickly. Can't hear you. Where are you? Pastor, you're <laughs> muted. Oh. All right. There you go. Let's try that. Where where did where did I drop off? Is and it the you, homily? After you came, <laughs> no, after you came back from <laughs> something in the chat. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so November 1st is All Saints Sunday. And um, our practice here is to do a remembrance of people who've died in the past year or people who've been baptized in the past year. Um, there is a link to a Google form there so you can submit names to me um, for inclusion. Um, people who are members of the church here, I pull names from the parish register so you don't need to worry about, you know, Helen Collard and sort of, um, you know, Sally Rutherford. But if you have friends and family, then please use the Google form or just email me. Um, I invite you to do that. And whatever I have at 9 a.m. tomorrow is what I'll work with. Um, and then the last thing is we have Sunday school at four today. Um, so if you're one of our Sunday school people, I hope you'll log on to that. And let's go to the next slide. This is, we're in the middle of our stewardship drive and we've been sharing reflections from people. Uh, this is from Bill Whitney. I'll, I won't read it in Bill Whitney's voice, but uh, Bill, Bill and Peg say, so much of life has been off kilter this year, even church life. A constant in a changing world has had to deviate from normal. But still, Advent has been there. Every week in our family room, Peg and I find comfort in the familiar liturgy, the hymns, Pastor Joseph's insightful sermons, thank you, Bill, and the friendly unmasked faces we see on Zoom. We continue our financial support because our church continues to be a source of comfort and spiritual nourishment for us, and because we want Advent to come out of all this strong as ever. That's from Bill and Peg. And just a reminder, you can pledge online or you can do it by mail. And if you pledge, you get a illegible postcard from me thanking you for pledging. <laughs> uh, let's go to the next slide. And I invite you to receive the blessing and dismissal. Be careful as you go out into God's creation, for it does not belong to you alone. Be alert and hesitant, for sometimes God is but a whisper and be gentle with one another, for you are beloved. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, seek unity with all. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Should be
Thank you, Jason. My pleasure. So I got to ask Janet, is that, is that a virtual background or are you actually outside in your garden? I can't tell. She's muted. I, I think it's virtual, but. <laughs> right. my, my, my mic wasn't on, I'm sorry. It's go. just a picture of my garden in the background. You look like, some like gnome sized, I was gonna say. Now that I see it bigger. <laughs> a little cool sitting out there this morning. <laughs> yeah, I was uh I was I was gonna ask everyone to keep uh Wyckoff reformed in your prayers because they're meeting outside and I think it's gonna be uh you know chilly. Yeah. 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 